And we're back. This is part six of a series known as The Woman with 1.5 Hands. Originally, parts four, five, and six of this series were all contained in one chapter of a manuscript that I called chapter four, or a different approach. If you've been following along in order, though, your most recent viewing of this series was a sidebar, a rather lengthy sidebar. So lengthy, in fact, that I thought it should be its own video. Anyway, time to regroup. Right before I started that huge sidebar, I had just wrapped up my first qualm with Jade and Tone, treating as indisputable their 17.6% figure. This qualm had to do with the example of a mother of a teenage daughter who willingly had sex with another teen, and this mom wanted him to do time for statutory rape. Parents are sometimes that way? Fine. However, if these teens marry each other and have never been violent or forceful with each other, I'm not so sure I want the NBAWS report, or reports like it, to include this kind of sex in the same category as forcible rape. In other words, if there are enough statutory situations that aren't forcible rape, maybe 17.5% of American women have been raped is more correct than the 17.6% figure. Or as previously noted, since this is such a tiny exception to the bulk, maybe 17.58% of American women have been raped is even closer to the actual figure. Any which way, yes, it's an exception, and it's often best to not base your entire battle plan on exceptions to the rule. Unfortunately, too many women do just that, but in another area, which has recently been addressed in a huge sidebar that became its own video. And now I'm in a loop. Well, no. Actually, I did have another qualm with this 17.6% figure. A qualm that, if realized statistically, might lower it to 17%, maybe even a little lower. So it's not exactly a qualm, it's more of an out and out objection. Either way, I'll introduce this reservation with the following boy meets girl hypothetical scenario. They meet, there's a progression from a date, consented to by both, to a kiss, again consensual, to petting, and more. Meanwhile, various stages of undress are proposed, and the completed stages are all consented to by both parties, including both being completely topless at one point, and so on and so forth, everything mutually consented to to proceed. But then at one point she said stop, and within one second he stopped. He never ejaculated, he never penetrated her, he never tore her clothing, and he never did anything physical to her that she didn't do right back. For instance, one time she was on top, another time he was on top, whatever, back and forth, mutual. No coercion, no force, no threats, no violence happened either way by either party ever. So what we have here is a textbook case of something that wasn't rape, and it also was not attempted rape. I don't think we have to hand out gold stars to guys who instantly stop when she says to stop. But I also don't want statistics to be artificially inflated because the actions of a guy like the one I'm currently describing get lumped in with other actual attempted rapes on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, researchers like Jade and Tone come along and, following some more statistical wizardry, include in their reports that his actions were rape when clearly his actions had been recategorized from non-rape to attempted rape to rape. For example, here's verbatim a question asked of those surveyed in the NBAWS. Quote, has anyone, male or female, ever attempted to make you have vaginal, oral, or anal sex against your will, but intercourse or penetration did not occur? End quote. Clearly, my boy meets girl scenario could easily include an attempt at something of a sexual nature without violence or coercion or penetration or threats of same that is within a second or two rejected, i.e. she said stop and then he stopped real close to instantly. And then years later she gets a phone call and in part because she doesn't know her answer is going to be reclassified as rape, this respondent will answer yes to the above question. Note. I examined several more survey biasing techniques and interpretational quirks in my footnotes. Also, this is a great time to trumpet one of the many accomplishments of feminism. I call it the above a boy meets girl scenario because it's a literary device. And 
man meets woman just wouldn't cut it. Calling women at the office girls, however, they're women, but you call them girls. It used to happen in the 50s, like Mad Men, for instance. Calling women at the office girls, however, used to go hand in hand with not paying them as much, not paying them what they were worth to the company. Women can thank feminism for turning that stuff around. More on this later. Which brings up the issue of why I used the word reports a few minutes ago in the sentence. My point is, reports of attempted rape are so heinous and hurt so many so much, and not just, not just psychologically, but physically as well in many cases. By the way, this wasn't a few minutes ago. This was in number four, part four. I chose the word reports for that sentence because either a real attempted rape happened, like the one I described in video four, um, the attempted rape where she had two broken arms. Anyway, I used the word reports for that sentence because either a real attempted rape happened and was heinous, or something else happened that was also heinous. The police spent tax dollars chasing down a false lead and arrested a man who neither raped nor even tried to rape anybody. We're talking hideous here. Hideousness. Because this innocent guy might get battered or raped or even murdered in prison, in part due to enough jurors voting for a conviction after having read or heard about the NVS's inflated rape statistics, if, if, if in fact they are inflated. And again, I'm not saying this stat 17.6% of American women have been raped is on the whole inflated. Other stats might be, they're next. But first, a reckoning. Right from the beginning I stated that if this 17.6% figure is wrong, then the correct percentage of American women who have been raped is a bigger number than that. In other words, 18% or higher. Some even go as high or higher than 25%, which I discuss in the addenda. Perhaps I have made myself clear by this point. Whatever the case, Jaden and Tone reported that 17.6% of American women have been raped, and though it's an estimate, it's based on information gathered during 8,000 phone calls to adult women and then extrapolated from that. What they gathered and how they proposed to present it was pre-approved by the CDC and the NIJ, two national organizations not known for granting grants on whims. Their methodology? Sound. Rigor? Yep, they were rigorous. Point made. Second point. Here's how I arrived at 17.6%. First, I looked at ways that figure might be underinflated, then ways it might be overinflated. They basically cancel each other out. To be clear, a base got established, say 14.8%, then increased with probably overlooked and or, and, and or somehow miscounted areas, resulting in a subtotal of, say, 80%, followed by subtracting some of the statutory situations that probably weren't rape and certainly weren't forcible rape, and allowing for or conceding that something less than 1% of all cases of alleged attempted rape would be more accurately described as a case of boy meets girl, as per my hypothetical scenario that you just heard. Here an observer might say, much ado about nothing, or wonder why I went to so much trouble to wind up with essentially the same figure they did. The best way to illustrate the necessity of the last few minutes of this video is to go over the exact words of Jaden and Tone. Quote, 14.8% of the women they phoned said they were victims of a completed rape at some time in their life, whereas 2.8% of the women said they were victims of an attempted rape only. These findings are noteworthy for two reasons. They indicate that most rapists are successful in penetrating their victims. They also demonstrate how the definition of rape used in a research study affects who is counted as a victim and, consequently, victimization rate. End quote. Which I'll interject is like saying special people are special. Others may call that last sentence of theirs an example of reflexive logic or circular reasoning. Pretty interesting is what I call it. Interesting that they use the word effects instead of contorts or distorts or inflates. As if that weren't revealing enough, their very next sentence is, quote, research will find higher rape victimization rates if studies include attempts in their definition of rape, illustrating the maxim that the broader the definition used to measure victimization, the higher 
the victimization rate, end quote. Question, how broad do we want to broaden these definitions? And by we, I mean we voters and or taxpayers and or parents who don't want our daughters raped. Will these definitions be broad enough, for example, that when a man reenacts the exact behavior he witnessed dozens of other men performing at Arrowhead, namely scooching past a fellow customer, but because he's not wearing an Armani suit, and instead he's wearing greasy sweatpants that are torn in the knees, and because this scooching happens inside a Target or a Walmart or at the DMV, he then gets charged with attempted rape? Will that be broad enough? Those of us who care about our daughters want those who truly rape locked away or something more permanent. And we want those who truly attempt to rape locked away too, or more. But how do we know when those who are driven to acquire more and more rape awareness grants have broadened their definitions enough? Quote, zero rapes reported on campus during fall term, end quote. That was a headline printed in my university's newspaper one winter in the mid-80s. But, the article went on to say, rape was still on the rise because a negative number of women had been raped during the term or the year prior to that fall term? One way to discredit a researcher is to say he's doing nothing more than duplicating previous research. With that in mind, it should be noted that the University of Louisville's school newspaper reported that during the entire year of 2009, not so long ago, there were zero rapes on campus. And that article also went on to say that rape was still... When reducing the problem to zero is not enough, I know I'm not the only one who says it's time to start asking questions that have to do with foundation. An analogy would be, instead of it being a question of a tune-up or an engine overhaul, perhaps it's a question of solar or wind. And it's time to say bye-bye to burning fossil fuels altogether and hello to going green. The thing is, though, it doesn't really help to ask those suspected of having an agenda if they have one. Here's what those of us who care about our daughters, mothers, grandmothers, wives, girlfriends, sisters, aunts, nieces, and female cousins want to avoid. We want to avoid the distortion of rape statistics because it leads to distorted viewpoints of this very serious crime. If rape statisticians get the reputation of often constantly aggrandizing their statistics for the sole purpose of getting more funding, then voters may vote down certain much-needed measures. Voters, disillusioned, just might vote down, for instance, the construction of another rape shelter. And according to exit polls, those who say they voted against it will say they did so just on principle because voters will feel more and more like those who propagate this industry's ideas are simply lying. Pure research is needed, and if that's too hard to come by, then purer research is needed. More balanced, less biased. Perhaps those executing the bulk of the research in this area are too established, too entrenched, their vested interest so intractable and their agendas so ingrained and deep-seated that they start every experiment with nothing but preconceived notions that every hypothesis and theory is worked out ahead of time, long before that first number is dialed, before that first Bunsen burner is lighted, before that first test tube is filled with a pungent substance, and before they sharpen that first number two pencil. Is impartiality, or anything even approaching being impartial, now so extremely unlikely in this field that it's impossible to attain? I'll do example number two of why pure research is needed. To get us there, I'm going to take another swipe at something I mentioned in uh, video number four, followed by a retraction of sorts. And here, let me restate what I said. Quote, here's why. If a judicial or legislative brief containing either this manipulation or interpretation of the stats were being considered for admittance as evidence in court, I not for the letter of the law, so to speak. In other words, 14.8% does not equal 17.6%, especially putting a possibly innocent person behind bars were in the offing. But since all Jaden and Tone did was conduct a phone survey intended to increase public awareness of rape, 
but I'm all for the spirit of the law in this case. End of quote. That's a great place to start if that 14.8% figure is a solid or sound number. But how do we know it's a good to go number and or if it's accurate enough to be considered a legitimate component of other numbers? Moreover, after further consideration, I think that certain rape oriented statistics are being considered for our own court, the court of public opinion, with most of us settling somewhere near the middle or average, an average that clearly tilts one way because it's been dictated to us almost exclusively by those who need what they fix to stay broken enough so that it justifies their need for more and more funding so that they can continue fixing. Bottom line, none of us actually are jurors at one time or another. That said, I'm changing the above so that it reads that attempted rape is not rape. Critics of this development are probably limited to those who think certain words or terms on the following list are interchangeable while other words aren't. List begins, completed rape, tickle, and attempted rape. List over. What I'm saying here is that someone who conflates tickling with an attempted rape, and he knows it was an attempted rape, man, you got a sicko on your hands. Someone who needs to be doing time if he's the one who attempted to rape. But by that same token, I don't think completed rape and attempted rape are always exactly the same thing. The damage from an attempted rape can be catastrophic, but included in the damage from a completed rape, as it differs from a non-completed rape, is a much greater chance of dying during childbirth nine months after the attack. Not that I'm looking in any way, shape, or form for anything that even remotely resembles a silver lining, and merely trying to show different ways that attempts and completions are different enough, often enough, that those employed in the social sciences should not willy-nilly toss them around as if they were synonyms. I attempted to give you ten billion dollars. Don't you feel richer? I addressed this change thoroughly in my footnotes. Even more so though is this idea that awareness is needed now more than ever and that it's good to fluff up certain statistics so that more become more aware what, in half or three quarters of the women in Walmart clutching their keys like it's their my precious isn't proof enough that enough are already supremely aware? The proof is out there. It's unimpeachable and it can't be ignored. A preponderance of American women have already heard and tasted, if not slurped and guzzled, the Kool-Aid of the message promulgated by those established in the field of rape awareness. The problem, though, is that their message is a distortion of what rape is what causes it, how to prevent it, and more. And if a distortion is not taking place, somewhere, b somewhere between the promulgation of their ideas and the actualization of typical rape defense strategies, how is it possible that at Arrowhead, not one woman within my line of sight held her keys? I discreetly looked at hundreds of female hands inside that stadium. I listened as I always do for the shaking of keys to let me know my place. It's just about impossible to miss the distinctive sound of nearby jangling keys. I once shook my keys at arm's length amid the plangent clangor of a racing fire engine in full bloom, holding my keys as far away from my ears as possible and standing as close to that huge diesel pumper as I dared, which was the curb. Actually, I, I took one step off of the curb and that truck missed me by no more than seven feet. And yep, I could still hear the high-pitched clanking noise of my own keys under or around or through the piercing yet deeper-pitched sound waves of that fire engine. What I'm trying to say is that if anybody had his or her keys out and clinking within 100 or certainly within 50 feet of me at Arrowhead, I would have zeroed in on it and after gaining confirmation, i.e. seeing keys in hand, I would have said to my wife something like, there's one! I knew there had to be at least one of them here, but nope. Evidently, no women at that game near me had heard about using keys to defend against rape. Yeah, or they'd heard, but what they'd heard was a completely one-sided version of rape defense, a version so distorted that adherents get raped more often per capita than those who are either unfamiliar with it or choose to employ other methods to avoid being raped. 
Here's another analogy. Even though spectators, bailiffs, court stenographers, and the like would like to think of themselves as influential, there are probably only three or four camps inside a courtroom that can determine justice or the outcomes of trials. Judges, lawyers for the defense, lawyers for the prosecution, and the optional participants, juries. Judges and juries weigh the evidence, both pro and con, for and against, etc. Example number two of why pure research is needed has to do with, in an analogous way, the behaviors of prosecutors and defense attorneys. It's as if what we've heard about rape from those entrenched in the upper reaches of the anti-rape industrial complex, or Terrico, are words we would hear in court from a prosecutor or from a defense attorney. One or the other, for this analogy it doesn't matter which, but it's only one or the other. My point is, what we're hearing from high-ranking members of Terrico and what we're reading in their findings comes to us from one side of the courtroom only. They're not weighing both sides of the issue. They're not weighing both sides of the issue. They're only dealing with the rapes of women. <coughs> Wrong. Jaden and Tone also called 8,000 men and asked if and how they were victims of rape. Not how they perpetrated, but how they were victimized. In other words, it wasn't a disguised witch hunt. Rather, they were trying to be fair. And if that's not proof enough they were trying to be fair, they wrote in their findings how only women called women, but of the men they talked to, half were surveyed by men and half were surveyed by women. Just in case some men felt uncomfy revealing sexual matters to women, while other men possibly may have felt weird talking to men. Regardless, the stats gathered from both halves were nearly identical. Still, though, it didn't hurt that they were trying to be fair. Or were they? After ascertaining the respondent's age was at least 18, affirmative answers to survey questions posed to males regarding sex considered to be statutory rape and then subsequently included with all rapes of males did not exclude voluntary homosexual encounters. The dalliance then between a gay 17-year-old and his gay 18-year-old boyfriend was tallied in the NVAWS report as rape. Also in dire need of a different category than rape was a behavior popularized by the ancient musicians Van Halen in their song Hot for Teacher. If a male respondent revealed that before he turned 18, he had had a sexual encounter with anybody over the age of 18, including Mrs. Finkelhor, his comely math teacher, that action was again listed as rape in the annals of the NVAWS. Clearly a willing 10-year-old is not part of my example here, even though there were males who appeared to be that young in the Van Halen video. Here's a good place to note how governments usually weigh in when asked for their opinion on this issue. Future taxpayer status. The history of the age of consent in the U.S. reveals a gradual rising from about age 12 to what it is now, age 18. This age limit parallels increases in compulsory education. As we migrated from a more agrarian society to a more industrial one, the imperative to further one's education was increased from finishing, say, second grade to finishing eighth grade to what it is now, finishing high school or at least getting a GED. Laws are very strict against, say, your eight-year-old not attending public or private school or not passing her yearly homeschooling tests, but these laws grow less strict as the age of the student, future taxpayer, increases. Over the years, more and more reports have been published alluding to the tendencies of those with more formal education to earn more money and hence pay more taxes. Staggered after the first appearances of these reports were other studies studies that showed there was a link between teen pregnancy and those who ended up not going as far in school. Point being, U.S. legislators raised the age of consent to 18 because they felt, unequivocally, that we taxpayers would pay them less money if we had sex too soon. Or maybe they did equivocate. Maybe I'm wrong. Again. Consider, 12-year-olds are still allowed to get married in some states if they have the approval of the court and a parent or guardian. 
Most states allow 16-year-old females to get married if they're pregnant. So is this an equivocation or a waffling, if you will? Not really, because if this teen is already pregnant, her future as a taxpayer is more lucrative if she's married rather than single. So the state makes allowances when it's profitable for the state. But it's not really changing its unstated, unwritten, and obvious policy. But the thing is, if an underage male does what it takes to get someone pregnant, or willingly, perhaps even enthusiastically, has it done to him, since he personally can't become pregnant, his chances of being a healthy taxpayer someday are not diminished. He'll go just as far in school as otherwise. In fact, as in the case illustrated by Van Halen, he might even like his teachers so much, he'll go further in school and then pay even more taxes. After impregnating his teacher, or according to Jaden and Tone, his rapist, if he then wants to financially support that child, does he drop out of school so that he can get a job? Probably not. Either he's a dropping out kind of guy anyway, or if he cares enough about his child to want to support him or her, he'd get an after school job, work weekends, what have you. Either way, he's not showing like she would be. Therefore, he won't face nearly as much ostracization, if any, as his female counterpart would if he chooses to stay in school. So maybe America could benefit from some law changes. But in order to keep things looking fair, our government at the moment has it that the age of consent for males and females for both gay and straight sex is 18. I mean, unless you're married, of course. England? It's another story. Gay sex there is legal at age 16. Although the following probably belongs in the footnotes, expounding on this legislative angle here is probably not my biggest mistake. Discussing it anywhere in this series just might be. Can of worms indeed. Be that as it may, if I, were, if I were granted two achievable political wishes involving our elected senators and congresspersons, they would be, one, only female legislators get to vote on abortion issues, with male politicians being allowed to help with discussions, but not being allowed to filibuster. And two, only lesbian legislators would be allowed to vote on lesbian issues, and only male homosexual legislators would get to vote on gay male issues. I bring this up in, in part because I want to address an issue raised by Dr. Jeffrey Fishberger in an article printed in the New York Times on September 29, 2009. Quote, Recognizing and understanding one's sexual orientation occurs at different times for different people. Some people are aware of their sexuality as children, whereas others question this into adulthood. To expand, think about the following scenario. When a young boy talks about having a crush on a young girl, or a young girl likes a young boy, people don't generally say that they're too young to know whom they like, or that they've skipped past childhood into adulthood. Yet when a young person likes or has a crush on someone of the same gender, it often creates anxiety and discomfort for adults in that young person's life, and raises questions like, how could they know at such a young age, or isn't this just a phase? This speaks more to our society's continued difficulty with understanding and accepting of any sexual orientation other than heterosexuality, rather than a difficulty with the child's development. Though there is much work to be done regarding accepting lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, as well as challenging homophobia, the fact that people are able to recognize their sexual orientation at a younger age than in the past demonstrates that we are making strides toward greater support and acceptance of these LGBT people. End of Dr. Fishberger's quote. Perhaps this is an issue where our elected leaders can actually lead us can help us take more strides and faster. In other words, why not lower the legal age for gay sex to 16, maybe even lower, here in America? It would make for better taxpayers. Dealing with the societal stigma of being gay is troubling enough for these teens. If a young gay couple, a 16 and an 18-year-old, are made to feel like they're criminals, they're that much more likely to commit other kinds of crime, crimes that aren't victimless. Why punish either the willing 16-year-old or his willing 18-year-old gay partner for engaging in gay sex? More to the point, why categorize these actions as rape in a study like the NVAWS, a survey bound to shape 
or misshape as the case may be, public opinion. What I'm trying to say is that though they mention, quote, more than 70% of the male victims said they were raped before their 18th birthday, end quote, Jaden and Tone failed to mention how many of those 70% were actually cases of voluntary experimentation and not forcible rape, i.e. they were willing minors learning about gay sex from those over the age of 18. Explored more thoroughly in my footnotes is the notion that since most gays aren't going to learn about particulars and functions relevant to gay sex from their schools or their older straight siblings or their parents, where else but from the streets can they learn? A 12-year-old fumbling around with another 12-year-old won't accomplish all that much. It just makes sense that at some point, say, by age 14, gays would start looking for instructions from those with some experience, from those who are older. Gathered from other sources and listed in my notes is support for this notion. Also in my notes, I expand on and provide support for the idea that if Jaden Tone did in fact sample randomly enough, that easily a majority of the males they list as victims of rape should instead be categorized as sexually experimenting 14 to 17 year olds. But that's not the worst of it. My biggest issue with Jaden Tone, including results from 8,000 calls to men, has to do with them shedding tears over some 17-year-old male being raped, or raped, by his older sister's 22-year-old female friend. I could be stepping out on a limb here, but I think in this case that the Jaden and Tones of this country want at least his testicles, if not most of his penis and his testicles, to be surgically removed, although this may seem a bit counterintuitive, him being the victim, in this case, of rape. Think I'm making that up? Recall universal female applause and cheering for Lorena Bobbitt. Not really moved by ancient history? How about that guy who got his penis ground up for him in the garbage disposal this decade, only to have Mrs. Ozzy Osbourne herself cheer and laugh at him during her national TV show, giggle about him being sexually mutilated by a woman he was desperately trying to divorce, and even laugh during her alleged apology, and then not lose her job? Which is to say... Though I don't think they care much about the physical or psychological well-being of some 17-year-old male rape victim raped by his sister's 22-year-old female friend, Jaden and Tone use his victimhood so they can get more funding, funding that when it does go to a good cause, the construction and maintenance of public rape shelters, for instance, doesn't allow, legally, for taxpaying male victims of rape to acquire safety thereat. And we can thank Amnesty International for uncovering this legal loophole in 2005. And besides, isn't it an insult to a battered, brutalized female victim of rape to have her attack lumped in with some 16-year-old guy getting his rocks off with an 18 or a 20-year-old? I mean, they couldn't even get five adult males to say they'd been raped in the previous 12 months. And this out of 8,000 male respondents to a survey whose researchers tried numerous ways to bolster their numbers. How rare is it for American males who aren't in prison to be raped? I'm sure to a victim it's awful, but the numbers just aren't there to tandem it up in a serious discussion of women who get raped. That number five is even suspect. Statistical rules within the social sciences are such that if your percentages fall below the equivalent of five out of 8,000, which evidently it did fall below five in Jaden Tone's report, then because of its inherent instability, you can't compare it to other stats in a meaningful way. That, num that number could have been zero or one, and it's definitely four or fewer. But to those who read or heard about the report, it's been blown up to five. Again, evidence of statistical exaggeration. Here's a hunch. The only reason Jaden and Tone included calls to men was that their first grant proposal was rejected and they were told if they included male victims in their survey that they'd get their funding. I could be wrong. Again, just a hunch. So they were trying to make it seem like they were being fair. But what were they actually seeking? It's not like they were hiding anything. After all, the name of their survey was the National Violence Against Women Survey, not the National Violence Against People Survey. Self-interest is nothing to be ashamed of, though, and ordinarily, I would add no harm, no foul. But I pay federal taxes, 
some of which start in the CDC. Next time, let's be honest about what we're doing, Patricia Jaden and Nancy Cohn, and let's have other people, people who aren't making disingenuous phone calls, phone them in. Which is to say, half of your funding could have gone to a better cause. In sum, if the anti-rape industrial complex, while busying itself with only the rapes of women, is not weighing both sides of the issue, and weighing both sides doesn't have anything to do with men being raped or the prevention of men being raped, then what would representatives of Terrico be doing if they quit doing business as usual and started considering both sides of this issue? That answer is forthcoming, and it spread throughout the remainder of the series. Suffice to say for now that if members of Terrico, that is the anti-rape industrial complex, if these members started considering both sides of this issue, what they would be doing has nothing at all to do with blaming the victim. In other words, if a woman gets raped by a man, that man is 100% responsible for that rape, and that woman is 0% responsible for her own rape. I am not at all about placing blame anywhere it doesn't belong. This series of videos is about lowering the number of women who actually get raped. Soon, I'll start exploring alternative ways to avoid rape, ways that those in Terrico remain quiet about or haven't heard of. First up, it's time for a little Cognitive Dissonance, or the seventh installment of The Woman with 1.5 Hands. That's for next time. Seatbelts will be required.